I have a formidable task before me. I need to tell you today about 125 years of gospel work and assembly testimony. I need to tell you about 60 or more local assemblies gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus in gospel halls across the state of Michigan. I'd like to tell you about scores of devoted gospel workers that over the decades have fanned out across this state and served God faithfully with their lives. And the thing that I really wish I could get to, but I'm sure I won't be able to, are the thousands of individual Christians that have made up assembly testimony here. And their lives have woven a, a rich tapestry of service for Christ. And so I'd like to do all that, but I only have 45 minutes. So if you'll just let me hit the highlights, I think our time together would be well spent. Of course, the obvious question is, where do we begin? And I think we ought to begin today where we begin everything around the assembly, and that is with the word of God. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, please. And just some verses at the end of Mark's Gospel in Mark chapter 16. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. And we are going to read some of the words of the risen Christ. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, and verse number 15. Mark, chapter 16, and verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse number 20, And... They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. For my own soul, at least, this is a very stirring section of the word of God because in it I learn four vital principles that ought always to guide God's people and ought always to guide us in service and testimony for God. I learn, first of all, in these verses, the revelation of God's purposes for the spread of the gospel of Christ. He said, go and preach the gospel. I learn, secondly, the response of devoted hearts to the Savior's commission. I like to put these two statements together in my mind. He said, go, and they went. They didn't hold committee meetings. They didn't plan big advertising campaigns. They went in simple obedience to his word. The third thing I notice is simple reliance on heaven's power for daily service. I think these words are some of the most stirring words in our Bible, the Lord working with them. That was the key. That's the key to all service and gospel labors, the presence and the working of God through his spirit with us. And last of all, I was thinking of the results of doing God's work God's way. The Lord was working with them, confirming the word with signs following. And I think that while the apostolic day of miraculous signs has clearly passed, you and I are testaments today. We are the signs following of men who worked with the Lord in simple obedience to him. I want to echo what Brother Valance said. I had no idea what he was going to say, but I had written it down in my meditations already this week. We're not here today because of superior intellect or superior organization or even superior leadership. We're here today because there have been men and women who have heard the words of the risen Christ and in deep humility and humble submission have followed him. And so this 75th celebration really isn't about us at all. It's about a faithful God who has graciously allowed us to have some small part in his work. It has been the Lord working with us 
from first to last. And I trust today that we will give him the glory that truly belongs to him, because it does for all that he has done. Now, in order to tell the story of gospel work in Michigan, I need to go a long ways from here. I need to go a couple of thousand miles to the rocky coastline of northeastern Scotland, where God, in his amazing grace, saved a man through the simple words of John 18 and 8. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. The man was Donald Ross. And I hope before the day is over, you'll get a chance to go into the little room that we've created over here on the side. And just stand there for a minute and look at the picture that's in the very center of the wall. It's the biggest picture in the room. It's a picture of Donald Ross. And I would hope that for all of us, there might be some ambition to take a little of the spirit of Donald Ross home with us today. Donald Ross was appointed the superintendent of a mission that worked on the northeast coast of Scotland. And around him, he gathered a little band of men. I actually thought of the words of 1 Samuel, a band of men whose hearts the Lord had touched. Men like Donald Munro and John Gill and John Smith and John Carney, men who would later work here in North America, many of them preaching right here in the city of Detroit. These men were spiritual men. They were genuinely born again, and they had within their souls a burning desire to reach souls for Christ. In 1859, there was a great revival. It began in the uh, country of Ireland, but quickly spread throughout uh, all of the British Isles. And as a result of that revival, there were tens of thousands of people that were converted to Christ. And I want to tell you, it didn't make the devil happy. And there was tremendous opposition that was raised to these men. And as a result of it, they decided to sever all relationships with denominational systems and to launch out independence on God alone. They formed the Northern Evangelical Society in 1870. And in 1871, Donald Ross discovered from his Bible the great truth of being baptized. And in that year and years to follow, there were little companies that learned about breaking bread in simple obedience to the words of the Lord Jesus. Mr. Donald Munro, a close confidant of his, had relatives who lived in Park Hill, Ontario. Mr. Munro had visited here in 1871, 1872, and on returning to Scotland, he was baptized by Mr. Ross, and he returned to Canada to begin preaching the gospel and to begin forming local assemblies. One of the first gospel series that was held here in our continent was held in the town of Hamilton, Ontario, just a couple of hours to the east. Mr. John Smith and Mr. Donald Munro were preaching the gospel for many weeks. And lest any of you should think that gospel work in those days was any easier than it is today, they preached for many weeks faithfully and saw no one saved. One of the preachers, whose name has been lost to history, had his suitcase out in his room. And he was packed and ready to give it up and move somewhere else. But God in his great mercy did something in one night. He saved three young men. One of them was a man named William Faulkner, who had served God. Another was a man named Kenneth Muir. And the last was a man whose name I hope all of you have heard of. If you haven't heard of it before, you're going to hear plenty about it from me. His name was Thomas David William Muir. And since no one in their right mind can say that whole big mouthful at once, we just call him T.D.W. Muir. And that night in... 1870, uh, 1874, T.D.W. Muir was saved. T.D.W. Muir was an extraordinary young man. Without a great deal of formal education or training, he dove into his Bible, and he became a, a master of the Word of God. But he was also a man who was stirred from earliest times with a zeal to carry the gospel. And at the age of 19, with 
Scarcely a penny in his pocket, he began to launch out in southern Ontario and preach the gospel. He preached with John Carney at the age of 19 in Straffordville and Forest and Lake Shore. But on New Year's Day in 1877, he went to a conference, the very first conference in North America. It was held in the city of Hamilton. And at that time, there was a remarkable meeting that was to have profound uh, consequences for all of us here. At that conference, T.D.W. Muir met Donald Ross. And there was an instant uh, relationship forged between this man who was already in middle life, a veteran of much gospel preaching, and this young man who was only 22 years old, who had a desire to reach out for Christ. They worked together for a couple of years, but Donald Ross in the late 1870s moved to the city of Chicago. He made that his center for gospel work and surrounded himself with some men whose names still live with us, men like Caleb Baker, the author of the Two Roads and Two Destinies chart. But at the Chicago conference in January of 1881, Mr. Ross invited T.D.W. Muir to visit the conference. And so he boarded a train in Ontario. He traveled to Chicago. And while at that conference, Mr. Ross spoke to Mr. Muir, and he said, you've just crossed this great state of Michigan. He said, I think that you ought to consider taking that up as your home, your residence, and as the center for your future gospel work. So Mr. Muir went back to Ontario. He married his young bride, and in the spring of 1881, he moved here to the city of Detroit. I need to tell you now, I'm going to take a little pause from the spiritual history. My wife said, this has to be interesting, and it can't be just a recital of names and dates. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what Michigan was like in 1881 when he first came here. Michigan has been a, a boom and a bust state for all of its existence. The fur trade in the 1700s, the forestry industry in the 1800s, and then, of course, Henry Ford and the consequential automobile industry in the 1900s. And this has been a state that has had a, a lot of ups and downs. When Mr. Muir came here, it was at the very peak of the lumber industry. And... Um, I have one little amazing fact for you here. In 1881, one-fourth of all the lumber that was produced in the United States was produced here in the state of Michigan. And that year, they cut over 4 billion board feet of lumber in the state of Michigan. And you say to me, how much is 4 billion board feet of lumber? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's enough to build a road as wide as Heinz Drive, 28 feet wide, around the equator of the earth, 28,000 miles long. 28 feet wide, 28,000 miles long, that's 4 billion board feet of lumber. That's how much they were cutting in a single year. As a result of that, and, and that's not just a random factoid, uh, actually it has a point and it'll bear on this story. The woods of northern Michigan were filled with people. Some estimates, maybe two to three times the number of people who live there today filled with blacksmiths and sawyers and cooks and people who worked with horses and, and all sorts of people who were in the industry. Northern Michigan was filled with people. Many of those people were assembly believers who had been saved in Ontario and coming to Michigan for work found themselves without an assembly or found themselves without Christian friendship. Others were immigrants coming over from England and Scotland and Ireland and Wales who had heard the gospel and were saved, but came to this new land because of job pressures and found themselves working in the woods of Michigan. This will come back in just a moment. The city of Detroit, where T.D.W. Muir came, in 1881 had about 100,000 people in it. And to put that in perspective, that's approximately the population, I think, of Livonia, where many of the believers live, uh, approximately the size of Ann Arbor to the west, where many folks here have gone to school. And uh, there were several things about Detroit that were significant. It was a city that was known for its salt mines. If you're not from Detroit, maybe you don't know this, but actually the city of Detroit has 
incredible mines underneath it, salt mines left over from that era. It was the home of uh, many big seed companies, famous all around the world. And the Ferrymore Seed Company was housed here in Detroit. It was the stove capital of North America. They made more wood stoves here in Detroit than any place else, and uh, a lot of other things about the city. But I brought something special for the locals. Uh, we're grateful for the visitors, but I got a couple things that local Michigan people will really appreciate. When Mr. Muir got here, a man named James Verner had been selling Verner's ginger ale in his pharmacy on Woodward Avenue for 13 years already. And Fred Sanders had been selling candy and ice cream and baked goods for six years when he first came. So I'm thinking things were pretty good. Ice cream and, and uh, Verner's ginger ale. The first telephone had been installed four years previously. And in the year he came, Joseph L. Hudson opened his first store in the Detroit Opera House. And for the kids here, the first baseball team was formed, the Detroit Wolverines, that later became the Detroit Tigers. When Mr. and Mrs. Muir arrived in Detroit in March of 1881, they came alone. They came to a situation of incredible affliction, illness, and poverty because they were all alone and hardly a soul knew where they were. Mr. and Mrs. Muir by themselves preached at the wharves of the foot of Woodward Avenue, now Hart Plaza, and in Cadillac Square. But you know, God was working from the very beginning. In August and September of that year, Mr. Muir put up a tent. He preached with a man named John Bain, and a number of souls were reached and saved from the very outset. They began meeting in a hall down on Michigan Avenue between 3rd and 4th Street, and in the fall of 1881, the very first assembly was formed downtown in the city of Detroit. They had a number of different stands. I don't have time, and maybe if you're not familiar with the history of Detroit, it wouldn't be all that interesting to you. But a little assembly was formed. Some of the names in that assembly, a man named Peter Crawford, a man named Willoughby Whitford, Ed and Jenny Soper, Sinclair and Grace Harkis, John and Annie Mowat, a little company of believers that God had gathered together to the name of the Lord Jesus alone. Well, T.D.W. Muir, was not content to rest with that. He immediately began to cast his eyes to the balance of the state. And as soon as the little assembly was able to conduct meetings on its own, he began to move out in further gospel enterprise. The story of gospel work in Michigan follows a couple of things. In the early days, it follows the railroads. Nobody had cars in those days. The roads were muddy most of the year, and most of them were horrible. And so much of Mr. Muir's work in Michigan could be traced along the tracks of the steamers that traveled up through Lake St. Clair and along Lake Huron, and the old railroads that used to run up through Flint and Bay City and up to uh, even as far as the Sioux. And as early as 1882, Mr. Muir was holding meetings in Bay City. There was work being done in the thumb of Michigan at Cass City. And in the summer of 1882, there were as many as five tents working around in these parts. It wasn't easy work. I want to tell you, the work of the gospel in those days was not for the weak of heart. Mr. Muir used to tell about putting his tent up in what is now called Corktown. Some of the local folks will know where that is, Michigan Avenue, uh, Michigan Avenue and 4th Street downtown, a large Irish population. Many of them were Catholics and uh, Mr. Muir would put up the tent, and at night they would cut the tent down. Mr. Muir would crawl under the canvas, and of course it was all black on the inside from kerosene lamps, and put it back up again, try to clean himself up for a meeting. And of course the next night the hoodlums with the police standing with their hands in the pockets would cut it back down again. It wasn't easy work. I did find one thing about tent work that um, I thought you would all enjoy. I brought some enjoyable things today. In Words and Season magazine, there was, a, there was a short notice about how you could make sure that your tent didn't leak water. And I think we all ought to know this today, so I'm going to read it for you exactly as it was written. And uh, if you're like me, you'll enjoy this. Leaky tents, we are told, can be stopped from leaking by the following procedure. 30 pounds of paraffin wax, 10 cents per pound at the 10-cent store. 
I think I, I got that part. Melt the wax, and while it is still hot, add four parts gasoline, taking care to keep it away from any flame. Put it on the top of the tent with a sprinkling can when the canvas is perfectly dry and evenly spread out, still being careful that there is no naked flame nearby. Um, Mr. Crawford, that tent you lent me many years ago, I'm glad I didn't have to employ this sort of uh, business with it. Uh, you'd have to be a brave man with no eyebrows to work in a gospel tent in those days. I want to uh, just conclude what I'm going to say about Mr. Muir by telling you about a couple things about him. One of his ways of working here in the city of Detroit was that as soon as an assembly was formed, Mr. Muir began to encourage not only fellow workers, but believers in the assembly to reach out to the next neighborhood and see other assemblies formed. I want to take a minute or two to tell you today about the fruits of Mr. Muir's exercise here in the city of Detroit. Now, I'm going to leave out what Mr. Valance is going to cover later about the assembly here in West Chicago and Stark Road. But let me just read for you a little of the early endeavors of Mr. Muir and gospel work here in the city of Detroit. Actually, this is very interesting. The very first assembly that was formed after the old Central Hall meeting was actually formed in Canada. Because in 1916, the assembly in Windsor was formed after believers from Central Hall in Detroit went across on the ferry and began doing a gospel work there. And for those of you from Windsor, you will well know that they first met in the Oddfellows Temple on Wyandotte Avenue near Oulette. And in 1916, the first of Mr. Muir's Hive Off assemblies was formed. Following that in 1924 in the East End on Pennsylvania Avenue at Forest, another assembly was formed. And God's work was pushed to the east in the, in the city of Detroit. In 1925, an assembly was formed that is still with us today. Glad to see some folks here from Ferndale. A little assembly was formed that met on Catalpa Court. If you want to drive to Catalpa Court someday, it's a little bit north of Nine Mile Road. And if I'm not mistaken, the house last time I looked was still standing where the assembly in 1925 first met to uh, act as a local assembly. In 1928, on December the 2nd, an assembly was formed uh, on West Chicago Boulevard near Burnett. And that is the assembly that many of us here are linked with today. And again, I'm not going to say any more about it other than to point out its timing in 1928. Then in 1931, very interesting assembly was formed. There was a Mexican assembly formed in Detroit. A man named Mr. Hopwood uh, worked among Mexican believers. And there were a number of Mexicans working in this city who were converted. And Mr. Muir encouraged them to see an assembly formed so that they would reach out to other Spanish-speaking people. And so on Elizabeth Street uh, in 1931, there was a Mexican assembly formed. In 1932, the last of the Hive Off assemblies was formed. It was an Italian assembly. Mr. Cesar Patrizio, Mr. Louis Rosania came and preached to Italian believers here in Detroit. And at the corner of Mac and Dubois, a little assembly was formed. Mr. James Ludus, the father of uh, Chet Ludus, who many of you know, was the first correspondent of that assembly. And Mr. Muir was very grateful. And in his later years, he often wrote and spoke about the wonder of these seven assemblies that had been formed by God's grace as he reached out in the gospel. I want to just make a, a couple of observations. Uh, Detroit was not the only place where gospel work was taking place in those days. And I'm going to tell you about some places where the gospel was preached and assemblies were formed that some of you maybe have never heard. There was an assembly formed, for example, in Ypsilanti in 1883. The precursors of the Schoolcraft Assembly are very interesting. There were a group of believers in the 1880s and 90s who were exclusives down in the Dearborn area. And on the occasion of the second Detroit conference, about which I'm going to talk in just a minute, in 1891, some of the believers, notably a man named Mr. E.B. Roy, came to that conference. They met Mr. Muir, 
And Mr. Muir graciously consented to come and teach them assembly truth. They thought they knew assembly truth, but Mr. Muir taught them the New Testament pattern in a way that they had never heard before. And that assembly thrived and prospered and throughout many different locations in Oak and Coonville and in Dearborn and later in Schoolcraft. The little assembly that was formed in 1891 stood for many years as a testimony to the Lord's name. In the early 1800s, 1880s rather, an assembly was formed in Bay City, in Cass City, in Yale, in Saginaw, in Osable, Standish, Sterling, Lansing, Alpena, many names that I could read off. But uh, I, I want to just uh, reiterate something I said at the opening if you missed it. There have been, in the last 125 years, over 60 local assemblies gathered to the Lord's name in gospel halls across this state. I think other than the province of Ontario, where I think that number might easily be exceeded, this might well have been the most fruitful ground for gospel work and assembly planting in all of North America. Sadly, there were some observations that might be made about the growth and spread of the gospel. In the first 20 years of gospel work here between 1880 and 1900, there were 18 assemblies formed in those 20 years. In the next 40 years between 1900 and 1939, there were 40 more assemblies formed meeting in gospel halls. If you're doing your math with me, that leaves from 1940 to the present almost 60 years. In that time, two assemblies have been formed that meet as we do and are in fellowship with us. I'll leave you to draw the spiritual conclusions from that, but I think that God ought to stir our hearts to reach out, to see more gospel work done, and to see if it wouldn't please him in his grace, to show us a little revival in work in the gospel and work in assembly testimony. I want to spend a few minutes just talking now about some things that um, I feel obligated to do in regard to work here in Detroit. Many of you will know that the Central Hall in Detroit uh, was an assembly that grew to quite an astonishing size. I need to tell you why that happened. In about 1900, the lumber boom was over. The woods were cut off in northern Michigan. The sawmills went quiet and terrible forest fires swept across Michigan. Uh, if you're interested in history, you might take the time to read about some of them. Some of them started almost at Lake Michigan, burned their way across the state, across the thumb of Michigan, killing thousands of people, destroying millions of animals. In some cases, burning the very topsoil that would have been good for farmers to use in the future, leaving a burned out, blackened state in those years around the turn of the century. As a consequence of that, northern Michigan emptied of people. And the assemblies in the southern part of the states became the beneficiaries of that. Assemblies like Saginaw and Flint, assemblies like Central Hall in Detroit, and even here in, uh, even here in West Chicago in Stark Road. I can look out into the audience and I see people whose heritage started in the lumber towns of northern Michigan. But as a result, of course, the work in Detroit grew immensely. The assembly itself in Central Hall grew to be over 300 believers. And the conferences that began in 1890 began to be enormous conferences. For many of you who are old enough to remember the last years of the conference in the Ionic Hall, Actually, they met in a number of halls. In about 1912, the conference grew too big for the assembly meeting place, and they met in a number of interesting places. I, I, I brought this list because I thought it was interesting. They met in the Degree of Honor Hall, the Oddfellows Hall, 
the Diamond Temple, the Danish Brotherhood Hall. I don't know where they came up with all these names, but there were a lot of halls in Detroit anyway for people to meet. But finally, they settled in 1929 the 39th Annual Conference in the Ionic Temple at the corner uh, of Grand River opposite Ferry Field. Those conferences were extraordinary. I think at the largest conference, there were nearly 1,500 people there with over a 1,000 people breaking bread. At one of the conferences, I think this was the high water mark, there were 52 full-time servants attending that conference. And the only thing I can say is if I'd have been there, I'm glad they didn't all speak because uh, it, uh, the world itself could not contain them. But nonetheless, the, the conference was really quite astonishing. A dear man up in northern Michigan many years ago, he's now long gone home to heaven. I was sitting on the couch in his living room one day. He told me a story about one of those conferences, and I've kept it, and I've remembered it, and I want to tell you about it today. Prominent lawyer in the city of Detroit heard about the Central Hall Conference. And he came and he actually observed the breaking of bread. Over a thousand people sitting down to remember the Lord Jesus. When the meeting was over, he turned to the person next to him and said, uh, who arranged this service? And the person said, well, uh, there was no arrangement. He said it was led by the Holy Spirit of God. The man made a comment that I want to relate to you today. He just shook his head and he said, only a genius could plan a meeting like that. I hope that would be the experience of guests who come and visit our meetings. And I hope a little of the spirit and power of God that we're seeing in a meeting like that would be seen still with us today. I have about 15 minutes left and I think my timing is just about perfect because I'd like to tell you about some of the workers that worked here in the state of Michigan. I'm sorry to tell you that many of their names have actually been forgotten. I'm going to tell you about some people that maybe no one in this room knows about. And I'm really honored today to be able to tell you a little bit about their stories and to remind you of some great men and women that have gone before us. I'm always reminded of the words of Sir Isaac Newton. He said, if I have seen further than others, it is because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think that for many of us here today, we feel that way that we actually stand on the shoulder of giants. I want to tell you first of all about the missionaries that have gone out from the state of Michigan. And here's one of them I don't think any of you have heard of. And by the way, this is a commercial. If any of you know more about this woman or her story, please track me down and help me with this one. But in the early 1880s, the little fledgling assembly meeting in downtown Detroit, sent a woman named Mary Ridley, who served the Lord in China for over 40 years. And the tiny little scraps of information I have indicate that she visited back in the Detroit area a few times after the turn of the century, but I know very little about her, and my best efforts have turned up very little, but it's wonderful to know that from the first little assembly, there was a dear sister that was sent to China to serve Christ. In 1927, a man named John Siraki was sent to serve the Lord in his native Czechoslovakia, commended from the Central Hall Assembly. In 1923, a man named Carl Kramer was commended to the Lord's work in Guatemala, where he had been raised. And for those of you who are aware of the Guatemalan Assembly here in Detroit, it is a direct result of some of the works, work that Mr. Carl Kramer, who came from to Detroit, was enabled to do. 1938, James Scollin was sent to Honduras. In 1946, the Central Hall Assembly sent Donald Cole to Angola. Uh, I forgot one. In 1927, Mr. F.W. Schwartz was commended to French work in Montreal. And the last one is someone that I knew. In 1973, Miss Donna Slack was commended from the Jackson Assembly to serve the Lord in Venezuela. And I just wanted to read these names to you and remind you that at least in earlier days, that the state of Michigan has been the birthing ground, if you will, for men and women who boldly went around the world to serve uh, the Lord. 
I want to tell you about a list of people now, and uh, I'm just going to give you just uh, what I would call thumbnail sketches. Would that be all right? And uh, just maybe pique your interest. Um, if you want to talk more about any of these, I'll, I'll, bend your, I'll bend your ear all night because this is one of my favorite topics, but uh, let me just introduce you to some wonderful men who serve God in this state. I've mentioned already Mr. T.D.W. Muir. He was commended from Hamilton in 1876. He came here to Detroit in 1881, and he lived here until his death in uh, 1931. And with Mr. Muir's passing, there was a passing of a real giant. The man who took up some of Mr. Muir's work in Detroit was a man named Hugh Cameron. He was not a full-time worker, but I want to mention Dr. Cameron. He was a medical doctor who came to Ann Arbor to complete his studies at the University of Michigan. But Mr. Cameron is noteworthy for a number of things. Mr. Cameron was involved in the earliest Italian work on the East Coast. He was in the Waterbury uh, Assembly on the East Coast and actually was involved in the formation of some of the very earliest uh, Italian assemblies. Many of the fruits of Mr. Cameron's work uh, are still with us today. Uh, Mr. Cameron moved to Detroit. He operated a very large Sunday school class, actually, for adults. Um, Mr. Cameron loved to have people memorize the scriptures. And there are a couple of people here in this meeting whom I won't call out by name who are old enough to remember some of the fruits of Dr. Cameron's teachings in his Bible studies and in his work uh, in the assembly. Another very early worker that I'd like to tell you about that many of you likely have never heard of was a man named Edward Soper. He was a printer who worked with his sons here in Detroit. He was in the assembly when it was formed, I believe, uh, in Detroit. And for a few years, he uh, served the Lord around the city of Detroit. He passed away of kidney failure in 1910 at the age of 64. And so he precedes everyone except a couple of the oldest who are here today. One of the real heroes of Michigan work, a man that I hope you'll take the time to go and look at his picture for a few minutes and look at some of the things that I have collected over the years that were personal belongings of his, was a man from the city of Saginaw called James Kay. James Kay was born in Scotland. He came to the United States and was converted in Ontario he moved to the city of Saginaw, where he was commended to the Lord's work in 1888. James Kay was a man who had a burning desire for souls. On the flyleaf of his Bible were just written three words, souls for Christ. And across the upper part of the lower peninsula, under circumstances that are indescribably rugged, Mr. K labored faithfully for God. There's a little red diary in the left-hand case in the little room over here for the year 1900. I have it there for one reason. In the year 1900 alone, Mr. K saw three assemblies formed in Wexford County near what we now know as Cadillac and where the Sherman Assembly is. A tremendous gospel worker. Regrettably, Mr. K's life was cut tragically short. At the age of 41, he and Mr. Tom Dobbin had a great exercise to preach in the city of Midland, where an assembly later would be formed. And one day, bathing in the Titabawasi River, perhaps weakened by some surgery that he had, pre had had previously, Mr. James K stepped into a cold spot in the water, and he drowned at the age of 41. And Michigan, at least from our perspective, not God's for sure, but from our perspective, was robbed of one of its great gospel warriors. Donald McGahey is another name that many of you know, commended from the Saginaw Assembly in 1893, labored very much in the thumb of Michigan. Alex McDonald, a man who labored with his brother, brother Robert in the thumb, saw the assembly in a little town called Glencoe. You wouldn't get that there was any Scottish connection there, would you? Uh, an assembly that many of you will remember by other names as well, Kindy and Bad Axe. And uh, Alex McDonald in later years moved to the West Coast, and I think Brother Crawford perhaps knew him. Um, but uh, Alex McDonald was a very faithful gospel worker in the state of Michigan. Here's a man that I don't think any of you have ever heard of. I don't even know his first name. His initials were A.F. Hudson. 
And as a young man in 1905, he was commended from the little lumbering assembly in the city of Standish. And he was commended to labor in the state of Virginia. It's not interesting. With a man named Brother Kendrick. But tragically, at the age of 31, he passed into the presence of the Lord. Uh, these were tough times. These were men laboring with very little under the worst of circumstances. And it's surprising, and it's only God's mercy, that many of them lived as long as they did. But we want to remember and honor men like Mr. Hudson, who, at the age of 31, laid down his life for Christ. Dr. E.A. Martin is a name that many of you will remember, and some of his relatives are here today. It's nice to see the Martins here. I was really glad that they came. Mr. Martin was raised in a little town called Yale, Michigan, up... Uh, well, north of here. And uh, on the eastern side of the state. It takes too long to describe where it's at. His family were exclusives. And Mr. Martin went east and began to practice medicine. But through contact with believers from local assemblies as we know them, he began to see the truth of gathering to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. In the early years, 1910 or 1911, he was in the city of Philadelphia. There was a man named David Souter there who had begun a little magazine called Words and Season. He wasn't a full-time worker. He was just a businessman, and he started a little magazine, and after a year or so, I think Mr. Crawford also will identify with this, he found that publishing a magazine and having a job were too hard, so he gave up the magazine. And uh, in any event, he uh, gave it over to this man, Dr. Martin. And for many years, Dr. Martin served the Lord faithfully throughout Michigan, and uh, he also was involved in the Words and Season magazine. If you're interested, there is also a picture of E.A. Martin uh, that you can look at. Leonard Sheldrake was a man who came to Michigan in those years. He came to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and labored faithfully there. He was often yoked in service with Mr. Frederick Mayle. And certainly many of us remember Mr. Fred Mayle. And Leonard Sheldrake was involved in much of the gospel work that took place in the eastern end of the Upper Peninsula and also worked down the western side of the state of Michigan. Robert A. Barr is a man that many have perhaps forgotten. He came to Michigan from British Columbia. He lived in Bay City. He was a man who worked with Mr. William Ferguson in the gospel carriage and uh, did a lot of labors here. In fact, he was involved with Mr. Ferguson in the planting of the first assembly in Grand Rapids. They met in a blacksmith shop, and Mr. Barr uh, was involved with that. Tragically, he and his wife were killed in a car accident near Chicago on some icy roads, and uh, Mr. Barr's name is often forgotten, but he ought to be remembered for faithful gospel service. John Ferguson came to Michigan from Scotland, moved with his family to Flint, Michigan, and later to Detroit. John Ferguson was the author of some of the hymns that we still sing in our Pacific Hymn Book, and uh, a man who was a, a faithful gospel worker. I'm going to say a few minutes about his son, but uh, I'm just going to leave that for a minute. I want to mention Fred Mayle. Fred Mayle, who was responsible for the formation of the assembly in Sherman in 1954, was a man who had worked since the 1920s in the western side of Michigan. He had an old Dodge motor car converted for a, uh, a Bible carriage, it was paid for by believers here in Detroit, and a very faithful servant of Christ. John Govan was a cabinet maker in a piano factory up in Saginaw. He was actually the correspondent of the assembly for a short time, but in 1919 he was commended to the Lord's work and later lived in Central Hall and then here in Stark Road, actually, before he passed away. Archie Stewart. How could I forget this one? I was saved in 1963 after a meeting by Mr. Archie Stewart, and I owe him a great debt today. He was a motorman on the streetcars here in Detroit, and uh, he was commended in 1928. He worked all up and down Michigan, and many of us with great fondness remember Uncle Archie and his service for God. He later lived in Central, went to Central Hall and later here in Stark Road. And so Mr. Stewart's memory is connected with the assembly here today. There's so many others that I could mention. Mr. William Wark, who worked in the woods with William Ferguson for many years. I could not forget Mr. Lorne McBain, who had a profound interest in me as a young person and showed his love to me in many, many ways, and whose memory is very much 
revered by all of us who are here. He moved to Jackson in 1929 and worked faithfully for the Lord in the state of Michigan. There's uh, one other little thing that I wanted to mention, and I got to get my licks in where I can get them, but uh, in looking through old magazines, there's one name that kept coming up over and over. It was the name of David Oliver from Philadelphia, 1910, 1911, 1912. I'd say he's remarkably preserved. Uh, actually, God has been good. He's given us two David Olivers. Maybe the Lord will be good and not give you two damn shots, but uh, nonetheless, lots of lovely names to remember. I want to close with some mention of William Ferguson. William Ferguson was an extraordinary man. Raised in the city of Flint, working in the Buick Motor Works there, he was a conscientious objector in World War I. He used to say he stacked corn stalks instead of bayonets. But uh, in 1918, he was released from the army and almost immediately was commended to the work of God from the little assembly in Flint. They gave him a gift of fellowship to launch him in his service. Anybody want to guess how much it was? $15. And with it, he acquired a gospel carriage, a little horse-drawn wagon, 12 by 6, and in it an axe and a lantern and a few tin plates and a bedroll. And for those of you who remember Mr. Ferguson, Dick and Dan up front, breaking the way. Mr. Ferguson was an amazing worker. If any of you doubt it, I want you to look at the map that's over here in this room and see the places that he visited in one year in a gospel carriage. Later on, he acquired a truck, but all across this state, preaching the gospel in little places, preaching the gospel in homes, enduring great hardship, Mr. William Ferguson worked. I love a story he used to tell. I remember him telling it. Not everybody loved him. <laughs> One day he showed up at a lady's house and he said, I'd like to give you some tracks. She looked him in the eye and said, the only tracks I want to see are your tracks going in that direction. And, uh, but Mr. Ferguson persevered. He saw assemblies formed in Alpena and Lorium and Grand Rapids. And in 1953, he married my mom and dad. So I guess I owe Mr. Ferguson a great debt. I need to bring my little message to a close. It's so neat to talk about all of these great workers, to talk about what they had done and their exercise and their love for Christ. And I have thought about their hardships and I have thought about their accomplishments. And I've just thought about three little things that I want to think about at the close of the meeting. I hope that as a result of these meetings and this history, that all of us will be moved to greater worship and praise to God for sovereignly bringing the gospel to us. Isn't that nice of God? Hope you don't think that's an irreverent way to say it. I mean it from my heart. How good God has been to bring the gospel here. Secondly, recognition of the faithful service of gospel pioneers who poured out their lives in devoted service upon the white fields of Michigan. Mr. Ferguson used to carry a poem in the front of his Bible. It said, there's a legion that never was listed, that carries no banner nor crest, but split in a thousand detachments, is breaking the road for the rest. Thank God for these men. And last of all, I hope maybe that the messages that you hear today will be an encouragement for others to rise up and follow the Bible's pattern. The words of the Lord Jesus today, beloved saints, are as real as the word that day he uttered them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. My fondest dream for this meeting is not that we have a good meal or a good time. My fondest dream is that Christ would be honored and that there might be one young man or one young woman 
who would look on the fields and see that they are ripe already to harvest. Thank you very much for coming. You can tell from, from the presentation that our brother Dan made that we are uh, new kids on the block, you might say. Many of you, I think most of you, will come from assemblies that are older than ours. And we're really happy that you came, you came along to observe this uh, anniversary with us. I want to read one verse in Psalm 88, or three verses rather. Walk about Zion, go round about her, tell the towers thereof, mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generation following. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Psalmist apparently is saying, walk around the temple or the house of God. Look at the towers. Think of the safety that it features. Look at the bulwarks. Think of the stability that, that, it, that it has. And then look at the palaces. Think of the beauty of it. And that is all true of the house of God. And then he said, tell it to generations following. That's what we would like to do today is to show how godly men have looked at the house of God, they have evaluated it, and they have preserved it for us with the help of God that we and future generations might be able to appreciate all that God is doing in the world today. Now, my subject today is the, the, the history of the, the West Chicago Gospel Hall Assembly. The preliminary, let me just say that some of the, some of the very early dates are uh, in question. In fact, some have even questioned the December 2nd date as being the first day that the assembly met. So I found a letter of commendation written by, from the, the Christians in Ferndale for a lady to come to West Chicago December 3rd, 1928. And it's posted downstairs. You can see it for yourselves. But so that establishes the date all right. And I remember Mr. Warren, who used to be in this assembly, he was saved in Ferndale on a Monday night at the prayer meeting. So I know I know they gathered there on Monday nights. And and it's just wonderful to think that this this documentation is available to us. Now in the late summer of 1926, a tent was pitched. And in West Chicago at Burnett on an outreach from the Central Gospel Hall, as we've heard, which was located in Grand River and Harrison. And the evangelist was Mr. Forbes McLeod of New Zealand. And then consecutively in the next three years, they had further tent work. And some of this is in question as to the, the sequence. But <clears throat> the sequence I have is that Mr. John Bernard and Mr. James Marshall came in 1927 and, and actually pitched a tent on the same, the same spot. And then in 1928, Fred Mayle and Leonard Sheldrake, the team that we've heard about already, they came and pitched a tent in that area. So <clears throat> between these uh, series of tent meetings, the brethren sensed that there was a work going on for God because many were saved in, in, the, in these meetings. Uh, possibly many children, I suppose, because they decided that they would begin a Sunday school and they rented a storefront and began to have Sunday school and gospel meetings there. So in 1928, 
uh, they decided that they would uh, begin to meet. And on December 2nd, after consulting with the responsible brethren in Central Hall, uh, which included T.D.W. Muir and Dr. Cameron, and in full fellowship with the assembly there, the assembly met for the first time in that rented store. Now, Mr. Alexander Stewart and Mr. Arthur McKay were among the first brethren to interface with, with uh, Mr. Muir and, and Dr. Cameron. And they went, Mr. McKay and Mr. Stewart actually went to Mr. Uh, T.D.W. Muir's home to talk to him about it and make sure that everything was right. And in, in a gesture of fellowship, Mr. Muir said, go ahead. As a matter of fact, there's a table. Take that and use it for your first breaking of bread meeting. Now, the thing was a relic when they got it 75 years ago. And uh, our brother Ken Nettie has, has restored it very beautifully, and it's downstairs. It, it's, not a, it's not sacred, so uh, I think there's a sign that says, don't touch it. But... <laughs> uh, that, that's one significant little item from that, from that date. And then in 1929, they, there, there, was, there was a sequence of three stores that were rented, uh, a small one on the south side of, of West Chicago, and then they went to the north side. But in 1929, as you can see from the very first day, letters began to, began to flow in from different assemblies. Now, the way I look at it now, uh, as Dan was saying, uh, there's an East Detroit and West Detroit. Well, we're, we're just in West Detroit, so this is my west side here. Uh, Woodward cuts it, and if you, if you took the, the city of Detroit and stuck a pin right in the middle of it, it would come very close to West Chicago and Prairie. And then, about five miles southeast was Central Gospel Hall, five miles directly north, was Ferndale, and about five miles west was Schoolcraft. So <clears throat> West Chicago was a very central location, and many of the letters came from Ferndale, and, and uh, especially Windsor. Windsor was a real staging ground for the assembly, because all, all the people who came from the United Kingdom at that time, they could freely uh, immigrate to, to Canada and live in Windsor, and then just wait until they had an opportunity to come over to Detroit to find a job and, 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 uh, and live here. So <coughs> I, Mr. Stewart has, has saved all these letters of commendation for residents. And there's just dozens of them coming from Windsor. Mr. Lever's hand must have been uh, weary by the time he got finished. It was... It was so remarkable that when we think of the assembly growth, starting in 1928 in December, this December, by 1931 there were 133 people in assembly fellowship. Now, that, that wasn't all because of the gospel work, but as I say, because many people found it central uh, to where they lived and also uh, coming in from, from Canada as well. But when we think of, of the, the growth of the assembly itself, it's very interesting that there were two series of gospel meetings that had a tremendous impact. And many of the, many of the, the, the Christians who were still in assembly fellowship when, when I came in 1950 were saved in those meetings. I mean, people from the, the neighborhood. For instance, I was just thinking of, uh, of one uh, who got saved in, in Willie. She used, to, she used to tell us, I got saved in Willie Wark's meetings in 1934. And others got saved in, in the other series of meetings, which was in 1932 by Laura McBain and Albert Kalbunda. Then in 1934, Willie Wark and James Smith saw a number of souls saved from the neighborhood. 
We, we think of uh, people like Mrs. Comming and Mrs. Wilson Miss, and Mrs. Kemp is the, the one who used to tell us about being saved in Willie Wark's meetings way back in 1934. There were a lot of people from the area saved at that time that, that gave, a, uh, gave more of a stability to the assembly. And, and we're, really, we're really thankful that the evidences of that are still with us today. Now, <coughs> the edification of believers was also an important part of the, the growth of the assembly. And uh, many able teachers came to minister the word on various topics. And uh, I, I just thought that the balance of, of gospel and ministry is something that we have tried to preserve down through the years. Now let me talk about the different uh, assembly accommodations and locations. The, the small store first met in 1928 and then the, the larger one in 1929 and they had that until August the 10th, 1937. Now you remember, uh, at least <clears throat> those of us who were older, that these were depression years, 1928-29, that, that was a big depression year, 1931, that's the year I was born, that was a real depression, and then, then it started to climb again. So these were, these were tough days, and they, they had to continue in this rented store for nine years. And I, I can hardly believe that 133 people were able to get into that little store. We went down there last week to look for the store, and the, that actual store is, is removed now. But there are two other stores similar on either side, and you just can't imagine that, that a store that size could hold 133 people, but it did for many years. Then work began uh, on uh, August 10th of 1937. The decision was made at a meeting of the trustees uh, to construct a hall in which the assembly uh, had on lots which the assembly had acquired uh, just adjacent to the store. The work began immediately. Now, just think of these dates. That was August the 10th, 1937. Then by January the 20th. 1938, that's only four, four months or so later, they, they had the basement completely finished and furnished so that they were able to gain access to the building and have meetings in it. And so <clears throat> January the 20th, 1938, the basement was adequately secured and furnished and the first meetings were held in the basement. It's, uh, it's interesting that in the ministry that day of uh, January the 20th, Mr. Forbes McLeod was back from New Zealand again, and he was there to minister the word on the first day that they occupied the basement of that <coughs> of the hall. And then work on the building ceased for a short time. The, the brethren were doing all the work themselves. They, they used to tell us that some of the neighbors would say, we, we've been watching you for the last few months. It looks like everybody in your, in your company was a, a laborer. You know, they were looking at the footings being put in and, the, and, and all the, the heavy work being done, digging and so on. And then later, <coughs> we happened to have one builder, four or five carpenters, a bricklayer, an electrician, and, and numerous layer, laborers, all in the assembly. Now that was, really, that was really nice. This master bricklayer, what, what a master bricklayer is, I re don't really know, but I think it's a really good one. <laughs> and, and, and they used to say that he could keep three or four laborers busy by, by getting the, the plaster up for him to put, it, put his bricks on. So they were, they were really interested in, in seeing the, the first the laborers and then the bricklayers and then they were all carpenters 
Then when they came to the meeting, they said, now they're all preachers. <laughs> so it, it was quite a, a testimony to the, the local assembly. By the way, the, the first building, the total cost when they moved into that was $15,000. Uh, I was going to say that right after, so they worked for four or five months, got the basement fixed, then they decided, well, it's January anyway, we'll give the brother a, a, a couple of months off. Well, that was only the physical labor they got off because Mr. McBain came with Mr. Robert McCracken and had meetings but in that interim period so that while the brethren were resting, these, uh, Mr. McBain and Mr. McCracken came and preached the gospel and then as soon as they were gone, they started to work again. Uh, God richly blessed the assembly as it continued there for over 25 years. Many souls were saved. However, by the early 1960s, the vast majority of the Christians began to migrate westward into these western suburbs where we're now, now located. It became clear that any outreach work would have to be done in those areas. And it was actually the result of outreach work that helped us to uh, determine what we believed was the Lord's will in moving here. Because uh, our brother Al MacDonald was given the responsibility, and this is in the record, of trying to get a Sunday school started. And he, uh, he started one uh, brief, briefly, I think, in the home of Angus and Grace Ferguson uh, in, in Westland and, or with Garden City. And, and then uh, he actually located the Pernville School down here a little later. But uh, Mr. Joyce and I had the responsibility of trying to map out the whole area and find, find a location that, uh, that would be suitable for us. So for almost the better part of a year, we spent every weekend, every Sunday anyway, and many Saturdays, giving out gospel papers and tracts all over this area and mapping it out. We went from Garden City to, to uh, the Farmington and from Redford to Plymouth. And we, would, we were looking especially for concentrations of ethnic or religious groups that would make it difficult to have a, uh, an outreach work. And we were just zeroing in on this area here. And at the same time, Al McDonald had come across Pernville School, which is less than a mile from here. And then our older brethren who were uh, driving around and looking as well, they finally found this, this, this lot, this, uh, this parcel of ground here that we're now in. And they bought it. And they began to work almost immediately on it. And then they put the old hall up for sale. And they had arranged it so well that the overlapping area between the, the sale of the old hall and being able to get into the basement of this hall, like we had done in, in, in West Chicago many years before, was only a period of five weeks. So for that period of five weeks, we were able to rent the school for the whole day on Sunday, and we held our meetings there. And the, um, the dates that uh, are significant then are November 7th, 1965, the first meeting was in the basement. September the 27th was the first meeting in the North Annex, so this, we only had this Annex at that time. Uh, we had a Bible reading in that room. And then the October 2nd was the first meetings of the full Lord's Day in this auditorium. It's a kind of interesting parallel too, which I think is, is significant. Remember the two dates. The first date that we, we uh, occupied totally the West Chicago Hall was October 1st, 
1939. The first date for this building was October 2nd, 1966. But this is this is uh, this was the interesting thing I I found that, that between the two hall openings uh, that in both cases the auditorium was temporarily cleared about six weeks previously to use as a best baptismal tank ahead of the completion of the hall. In August the 15th, 1939, Reginald Hales and Mrs. Willard were baptized, and in nine, and August 2nd, 1966, Mark Buchanan was baptized. Again, from the very beginning of our, of our stay here, we realized the Lord's blessing. The first series of meetings. Here again, don't rely on people's memories. Let's go with the record. The first series of the gospel meetings held in the new hall were held by Norman Crawford and Sidney Maxwell. And they saw a number of souls saved. And that included relatives of the Christians who were in their 30s and raising families. And we still have Mr. and Mrs. Ron Ritchie with us in the assembly yet, and Sally, uh, <coughs> who is their daughter. But further interest in outreach work in the Sunday school expanded interest in bi uh, monthly Bible readings and increased attendance at our annual conferences led to the expansion of the hall to its present configuration. And on Saturday, April 3rd, 1993, this new edition, uh, which is now 10 years old, was opened. And two of our brethren who are with us today, David Oliver and Mr. Norman Crawford, they were with us to minister the word at that time. I want to say just a little bit about assembly membership. Uh, <clears throat> within two years of its beginning, there were 133 in fellowship. And this number steadily increased to about around 160 in the mid 40s. And then held steady for some 10 years. But in 1956, <clears throat> now we've heard about the Central Gospel Hall they decided to sell their hall and move westward, way ahead of us. And, and that move, at that time, a number of believers who were not happy with the changes taking place in that move left Central and came to fellowship with us in the West Chicago Gospel Hall Assembly. The result was that the size of the assembly rose to its largest number of 173 people. However, the move to Stark Road took its toll as well, because, as I said, we were central, and those who lived east of us and those who lived north of us decided, it, and that's before the expressways were completed, that it was too far for them to travel, so they went to Ferndale and Schoolcraft, and we were sorry to see them move. And then during the 1960s, uh, economic conditions required that many of the Christians would leave this area and they were they went to uh, California Pennsylvania Illinois and North Carolina to find employment or their their jobs were transferred and whole families so we we took quite a hit and the numbers went down to 83. Uh, however, in November 1978, the assembly at Schoolcraft uh, disbanded and sold their hall, and some of the saints came and were a welcome addition then. Uh, and the, the number today, to my best estimate, is 96. Now, when I look at the assembly, when I came as a boy, 18 years of age, I looked at the old West Chicago Gospel Hall Assembly, and apart from about maybe a dozen young people, they were all old. And you could see the age profile was really way over to the right. But 
Now I look at the, the assembly and the assembly looks quite young to me. <laughs> uh, and you say, well, that's just your eyes. No, actually, I, th I think it's, it's possibly, uh, there's, an there's another reason. <clears throat> that's relativism. Now, we don't usually preach that from, uh, from the platform here, but we really only have one older person, one old person in the, in the assembly. That's Mr. Lyle. <laughs> now, he's 98. In a few months, he'll be 99. He lives by himself. He drives his car. He's at all the meetings. And he even comes down to the prayer meeting before the gospel meeting, gets down on his knees to pray. And believe me, he's up faster than some of the rest of us uh, from his knees. Relative to Mr. Lyle, we're all pretty young. And <clears throat> I, but we are happy to say that we really believe the, uh, the profile, age profile of the assembly has gone down significantly. And we're delighted at the progress that the young people have made. And I'm saying young, just meaning anybody younger than me. Full-time full servants of the Lord who have been associated with the assembly. Uh, we've heard of Mr. Schwartz and Mr. Archie Stewart. And Mr. Govan actually came over in 1956 from Central Hall uh, at, the, at, at that time that I mentioned. These men, these men were, were a wonderful influence uh, on the assembly. And particularly, uh, I, I, I really loved Mr. Govan. I, I, uh, I think of how his, the theme of his ministry was, and he's, he used to say it with such passion, that Christ is all and in all. Christ meant everything to him. And personally, uh, he was a great influence on, on myself. And I can say, uh, if, if Dan's going to uh, talk about weddings, uh, Mr. Govan married my wife and I in 1958. Uh, let me say something now about the oversight in the assembly. <clears throat> Mr. Alex Stewart and Mr. Sam Barr and Mr. Charles Kitchen, uh, they had responsibilities placed upon them at a very early age. Mr. Stewart became correspondent of the assembly in 1928, and I think he, he was barely 30 years of age, and he was a correspondent for 50 years. And we, we speak reverently of these men, not because they, they were perfect, but certainly because they were faithful. And we appreciate what they did for us down through the years. And they were associated with them in, in the earlier years with George Ritchie and our brother Don Garnham, and also Mr. Lyle. They, they, they certainly uh, <coughs> assisted the, uh, the, the, the other brethren, Mr. Stewart, Mr. Barr, and Mr. Kitchen. But in the last uh, recent years, the last 20 years or so, we've been privileged to have Don Clark and Elton Decker, Joe Dennison, Alec Joyce, and James Valence shared in the responsibility of the oversight of the assembly. And I can truthfully say that you, could, you couldn't ask for a better group of men. Gentlemen. And we, uh, we just were able to resolve things and speak about them, talk about them. There was no problems that we couldn't resolve. And uh, let me just say, particularly about our brother, Mr. Joyce, he doesn't uh, meet with us anymore. But we, we, we really respect his memory. And I was reading in the book of Judges, 
in the summertime. And this verse spoke to me. And I think it's appropriate that I should mention it. It's Judges 8 and 35. The Lord is bringing an, bringing an indictment against Israel. And he said, Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubel or Gideon in return for all the good that he had done for Israel. God wants us to honor men who have contributed to the, to the blessing of the assembly. And I'd just like to say, since it says, says here, the family, I'd just like to honor a brother, like Joyce and his wife Lois this afternoon. Thank them for all that they, the good that they have done for this assembly. Two things have uh, really been significant in helping us. The bi-monthly Bible readings. In 1976, it was our exercise to encourage young believers to study the scriptures. And at the same time, this was a sort of a new way of looking at things because you've got this, you've got to remember the old brethren, you know, they, they were pretty stiff in, in a lot of ways. They didn't like too many social things. So they, but we felt that we wanted to enable them to interface with and enjoy the fellowship of young people from assemblies in the area. And we had these bi-monthly Bible readings. They proved to be a great blessing. Friendships were formed that have endured through the years. And we've been happy to see the tremendous spiritual growth in many of our young people. Another uh, introduction we made was the summer series of special studies. So in a break from the consecutive study in our Bible readings every Wednesday night, in the months of July and August, when all the children are out of school and uh, out of college, uh, we have these special, uh, special series of, of uh, special studies. And sometimes the subjects are taken from the young people. We g gather them from the young people and put our ear to the ground. And other times, we think there are special areas that we need to uh, really study and, and minister on. And we have these on Wednesday night. The subject is outlined and introduced for 45 minutes. Then we have a break, and then we have a question and answer period. The, uh, the meetings are very well attended, and at one of our meetings this year, there was quite significantly more than 100 people out at our Wednesday night meeting. So, so we're very, very happy to see the interest in the study of the scriptures and the interest of the believers. It's just marvelous. Even the little children love them. And they call them the donut meetings. <laughs> they, they like that part. Now, the, uh, the assembly is also blessed with so many talented people who, who contribute their time and, and talents to keeping the place uh, in great shape. David Delfino guides the kitchen volunteers. Joe Dennison Jr. guides the dining room activities. And... It's difficult to estimate the contributions made by our sisters uh, who add a special dimension to the attractiveness and the decor of the building and, and of, the, of the, 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 uh, the kitchen and dining room and so on. And then I'd like to say that Jerry and Kathy Clark have done an amazing job of taping all the, our meetings and distributing the tapes. And these are, these are jobs that nobody seems to remember too much but we really appreciate them and they, cont and they contribute so much to the, to the well-being of the assembly and say that over the years Mr. Lyle and Mr. Buchanan and Crawford Buchanan and Elton Decker have proven to be handymen at large we were talking, Dan was talking about committee uh, decisions they don't wait for committee decisions to fix something, they just go ahead and fix it. And it's, it's really great to have people like that. 
Sunday school and outreach work have been well supported by the assembly. The most productive uh, has been am among the children, and some have been genuinely saved. We really in, uh, had a great uh, experience uh, recently of uh, the learning of, of a girl who got saved in Sunday school, and she's raising a family, and she wants her, her children to be brought up under the sound of the gospel. We've heard of others who have, who have been saved and they've gone on. And it's a wonderful thing. And then some teenagers come to our gospel meetings and they really miss a meeting. Over the past year and a half, because of this outreach work, they come to all the gospel meetings, even when we have special meetings, they don't even miss a meeting. They're better than, better than a lot of our own. And they're out, they're out at all the meetings. And we have to give our sister, Miss Jane Clark, a lot of uh, thanks for the, the love and the kindness that she shows to these teenagers that, that encourages them to keep coming. And the, the responsibility for this work now has been uh, shared by Jim Clark and Scott Yackel and Jim Valance who follow the example that was set by our brother Joe Dennison, who preceded them. Now, gospel meetings, I've got to hurry. I, I told David that there was no way that I was going to encroach on his time, so uh, very quickly. Gospel meetings, we feel that a series of gospel meetings is very, very critical to assembly testimony. And <coughs> I just listed three men who had a tremendous impact on this assembly. Mr. Lauren McBain, he had meetings in 1932 with Albert Labunda, 1938 with Robert McCracken, 1943 with James McCullough, 1950 with Norman Crawford, and 1969 with Jim Smith. Then Mr. William Wark, also a tremendous influence on the assembly, had meetings in 1934 with James Smith, 1946 with Steve Mick, 1955 with Robert Boyle, and 1968 with Arnold Gretton. Then her brother, Mr. Norman Crawford, had meetings, of course, with Mr. Lauren McBain in 1950, 1959 with Jim Lipke, 1967 with Sidney Maxwell, 1976 with Eric McCullough, 1984, alone with a chart on, on Revelation, 1992 with Stu Thompson in the tent in Dexter, and 2002 speaking alone again in future events from the book of the Revelation. Tremendous influence these men have been on the assembly here. I was thinking that if the Lord spares us and, and we live to see the hundredth uh, anniversary, I still won't be as old as Mr. Lyle, believe it or not. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to see David Oliver's name on there. And when I was thinking of this, uh, my mind went to uh, 1 Samuel 23, list David's mighty men. There's a fellow that, there by the name of Beniah. Some, some people say Beniah or Beniah. He was a chief man among 30, but he didn't attain to the first three. So I've listed the first three. Next time we want to list Mr. David Oliver along with him. Uh, and, and, and then, just let me say a little bit about the conference. Uh, for the first many years, until 1944, they had an annual meeting, but it was, there was a, a, a three o'clock meeting and a seven o'clock meeting, and all the names of the brethren who spoke were there but there was no mention of, of any food being distributed. And I often wonder, you know, did, did they go home for supper or, or what, what happened? But in 1944, the assembly began to have their first annual meeting of two-day conferences and to provide all the meals. Uh, that's why the annual conferences that we announce every year now uh, are so widely uh, different from the, the uh, history of the assembly. There were some years that we, we didn't have a, a conference. Uh, 
64, 65, and 66, and also in 1992. So I'll close now. These are synchronized, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> and say we're just, we'll pa pause to remember, and as our brethren have already indicated, all the way the Lord has led us, and to thank him for the sustaining grace in times of testing, times of rejoicing. We call to remembrance of former days, that's Hebrews 10, and trust that we might recover the enthusiasm. I think Dan was point, trying to uh, point this out as well, the enthusiasm of our first love for Christ and for his people. And then to remember our guides, those men who have influenced us by their example. And the scriptures say in Hebrews chapter 13, imitate their faith. I trust our gathering together today might stir us up to regain that affection and love for Christ that we did have in the past. Included will gather downstairs for dinner. <clears throat> Take my life and love.
Denison and the time's up, I'll sit down, even though it's halfway through a sentence. Hope it won't be. <laughs> First Corinthians, please. We're reading in chapter 2. The last clause of chapter 2. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, if you look in verse 3 of the next chapter, if ye are yet carnal. Verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Now back to Acts 2, please. I, I would find it very difficult to speak on this subject and not read about the first assembly that is certainly the pattern assembly, uh, two articles in a magazine that I know a little bit about uh, by Dr. E.A. Martin for the December and the November magazine. Uh, Dr. E.A. Martin that you heard about this afternoon, uh, he wrote articles on the assembly. I never have read anything more emphatic than what he said about Acts 2, that it is the pattern assembly for every assembly that has ever been formed. So Acts chapter 2, let us read familiar verses. <clears throat> Verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly. This is most important now in the apostles' doctrine, teaching, and the fellowship. That's the fellowship of a local assembly in the breaking of bread and the prayers. Those are assembly prayers when God's people gather together to pray. Uh, I have to say this. You'll forgive me, I hope. I uh, certainly didn't expect to be put with Mr. McBain and Mr. Wark in that description that Brother Valance gave this afternoon. Maybe I should tell you something. Mr. Valance is a friend of mine. <laughs> I met him the first Lord's Day he ever came to the Chicago Boulevard Gospel Hall. <laughs> it was in the month of February in the year 1950. And uh, little, little did I know that 53 years later <laughs> we would be in circumstances like this. Um, there is a little bit of personal experience goes into this message. Uh, I have been a small part of the planting of six assemblies. Uh, the reason I'm telling you that is that each time there were new lessons. I certainly couldn't write a textbook on how to see assemblies planted. Uh, maybe what characterizes every experience is best put in the words of Mr. Winston Churchill, blood, sweat, and tears. And I can tell you there have been the tears too. <laughs> so God has lessons for us. And uh, there were always fellow laborers, Mr. Lord McBain. I never could express in words the kind of help and blessing he was to me through many years. Uh, Mr. Jim Lipke, who has also gone to heaven a number of years, was a wonderful fellow laborer. Mr. Eric McCullough, he and I worked together in new places where assemblies actually did begin. And uh, Mr. Harold Paisley, in a very special way, Mr. John Kemper, and uh, to a lesser degree, Mr. Dave Kemper. So um, in those meetings, I learned some things. But I think the lesson that stands out most vividly in my mind is that in the year 1947, I went to Garnerville, Iowa with Mr. McBain for gospel meetings. That was in the beginning of May. And uh, when those meetings were finished, 
Mr. Louis Brandt asked me if I would join him for gospel meetings in the area of West Union. Uh, had three series, not right in West Union, but in villages around that town, and uh, God was pleased to work. Mr. Brandt had labored there for a number of years already with Mr. Wark and other brethren, uh, and as sometimes happened, I came in for the reaping. I didn't really, didn't really earn it. Uh, I was there to see the blessing result from those, the labors of those dear men. So we saw a number of souls saved. I'll tell you the lesson I learned. That first Lord's Day, when that assembly sat down to remember the Lord, and I looked around at the faces of those new believers, my heart melted. What hath God wrought? Men and women who were dark and ignorant, knew nothing of God or of his word or of his salvation, sitting down to remember the Lord Jesus. I don't know anything like it in this world. And no wonder we hold it as so precious. Now, I have some very simple things to tell you. I read at the close of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 because we have the Apostle Paul saying we have the mind of Christ. I think you maybe know that uh, there's a tremendous contrast here because to the Corinthians he wrote, ye are yet carnal. I don't know a greater uh, contradiction than the difference between the mind of Christ and a carnal mind. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. So uh, when Paul said we have the mind of Christ, he was saying something very positive and definite because twice over in this epistle, he tells these believers in Corinth that what he said to them was directly from God. He was speaking. This is in 1 Corinthians 2. He was speaking the words of God to them. And in 1 Corinthians 14, he told them actually that when he wrote to them, verse 37 of 1 Corinthians 14, he said, If any man among you seemeth to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandment, singular, the commandment of the Lord Jesus. It wasn't human opinion. It was the word of God. I hope we understand that because 1 Corinthians gives us the pattern of assembly gathering. I uh, have often said this, but I think it's worth repeating that what we have in the New Testament is a blueprint. We have been hearing today about this building being constructed and uh, about the annex being added and so forth. Uh, I can assure you that they didn't send a carpenter and say, start building. I assure you there was a plan. There was a blueprint and perhaps a number of them. But what does a blueprint do? What is a blueprint? It gives you the directions about what should be done. For instance, in that blueprint, it didn't say, don't put a stairwell in the middle of the auditorium. Didn't need to. Blueprint doesn't do that kind of thing. It doesn't tell you all the things you should not do. Sometimes Christians say, is there any scripture against this or against that? That's a negative question. What we want to know is what is the positive teaching of the New Testament? And it is perfect. And it is from God. And it is a pattern. It is a blueprint, if you will. And it tells us what we should do. So therefore, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you have the message that was preached. I, I'm very fond of this, but uh, the source of the message was God. That's very clear from chapter 2. The subject of the message was Christ on the cross. And the cross has a great place in 1 Corinthians. Perhaps you know that. Uh, there, there's hardly, there's hardly a, a subject about the cross that is not clearly taught in 1 Corinthians. And uh, I'm not going to go into that because that clock is moving faster than I wanted to. And uh, I can tell you that the message that was preached, the subject of that message, was Christ crucified on Calvary. The simplicity of the message was 
I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So there was a limit as to what he could preach when he was there. And then the success of the message, not in the demonstration of man's power, but in the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God. That's where assembly planting begins. Brethren, I believe in the preaching of the gospel with all my heart. I believe in the declaration of it, the public preaching of the gospel. People who have stopped preaching the gospel, who have given that up, you know the reason they give us? You don't convert the converted. Oh, I think our brother Oliver said this afternoon what I agree with 100%, that uh, Christians need to hear the gospel. I think I could give you a powerful argument for that. If Christians don't need to hear the gospel, can you explain the epistles to the Romans? Can you explain the epistles to the Galatians? <laughs> it's gospel truth. So uh, Christians need to hear the gospel. In fact, I have been thoroughly convinced that what Paul tells us about that preaching of the gospel is that that's how the truth is preserved. I'm very interested in that. You see, what we declare in the gospel is doctrines about the person of Christ, about the Godhead, about eternity, about heaven and hell, all the great truths of Scripture. We are actually defending the gospel when we declare it. Paul said he was set for the defense of the gospel. What's, what's the context there? Christ is preached and I rejoice. That's how the gospel was defended. And tragically, tragically I have known where there was no longer the plain, simple, clear preaching of the gospel. There was a terrible departure from basic truths of the New Testament. Let us not, let us not ever neglect to preach the gospel. It's the beginning of gospel. The, the gospel work is the beginning of assembly work. In fact, I, I would have to say that uh, uh, the difference, and this is what I'm going to be speaking about now for the rest of my time, the difference between an assembly and what we have all around us in the religious world, that difference begins at salvation. Now, I don't want to be too uh, simple. You're all intelligent believers, I think. Uh, but the difference begins at salvation. I was talking to a man this week, and he, he told me that, uh, that he's in child evangelism. Now, I knew without asking, but I thought I'll give him a chance to say. So I wanted to know how they lead souls to Christ. Oh, well, he said we, we tell them that they're sinners. Good. Uh, we tell them that they, they need to have their sins forgiven, and that if they ask God to forgive them, he'll do it. Is that salvation? Uh, let me ask you a question. Where is the verse in the Bible that says we should ask God to forgive our sins? Is it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, Acts? No, it's not anywhere. It's not there. Oh, you say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins? Even that verse doesn't say to ask for forgiveness. That verse says if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He never fails. And you know, I got to tell you something which impresses me deeply. What if I don't believe he's forgiven me? What if I, what if I confess my sins and don't believe he's forgiven me? I don't have any merit for him to forgive me. I can't present any case to him for forgive me, to forgive me. Why does he forgive me? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Even if I confessed my sin and didn't believe he forgave me, he'd still forgive me. Isn't that amazing? You don't ask for forgiveness. This is, a, this is a whole theory in the religious world that leads people to believe that if they say a prayer, they're saved. So the difference begins right at salvation. We believe sinners have to be awakened. We believe they have to be convicted of their guilt and sin. And the experience of each individual is unique to them. Nevertheless, every one of us, and this is old language that I still believe in, we came to an end of ourselves. 
before we got to Christ. Whatever way God used to bring you to that, I believe every Christian here would agree, I came to the end of all I could do, and Christ did everything. He did it all. That's salvation. Not me saying a prayer, not asking Jesus into my heart. So this difference begins right at salvation. Now, uh, I would say that um, what you have in 1 Corinthians 3 is a great consecration, uh, a messenger. And he feels the weight of the message that he carries. I, I pray for the man who doesn't feel the weight of the message. And sometimes I have to confess that I have failed to feel the weight of it myself. But this man was a messenger who felt the weight of the message. He said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Did he know the truth of it? He surely did. He felt the weight of the message he carried. He was a servant. And as a servant, he is characterized not by the weight of the message, but the willingness to serve. As a husbandman, he works as a sower in the field. As a master builder, he has wisdom in the building of the house. As an attendant, and this is, goes on to chapter 4, he's waiting for a word. The word that is used there in chapter 4 and verse 1 for servant is really the idea of one who stands and waits. You know what he's doing? He's waiting to hear his Lord. He's waiting for his word. I wonder how much that is my attitude day by day in my Christian life, that I wait to hear his word. All of us have had experiences at times when a passage of scripture, maybe a verse, maybe a word, maybe a phrase in the Bible stood out to us like it was in letters of fire. What is God doing? He's giving us his word in power, personally. It's a great thing to be an attendant, to stand and listen and wait for his word. Then, of course, he's a steward. And as a steward, it's the wealth of the treasure that has been committed to him, a precious treasure. And then he's a model. And that's his walk before men, before God. Now, there's a great communication here, and I have to get into it very quickly. There's the planting and tilling of a field. There is the plan of a building of God. There is the purpose of giving teaching, and that's going to allow me to key off on what I want to say. There is the purity of a temple of God, and there is something else in this 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there is the plainness of a testimony. <laughs> I like that. You see, we don't need additions. We don't need to borrow from the religious world. We don't need to imitate any of the world's ways or methods. The plainness of the testimony shows that it is of God. There's nothing to attract the flesh nothing there for human entertainment I believe in that very strongly I believe it's what preserves testimony for God but um, when you want to see an assembly planted uh, and you preach the gospel and God is pleased to bless the message and souls are awakened and they are brought to Christ and uh, what do you do then you begin to teach them oftentimes it's very personal Oftentimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. But there are times, of course, when it is gathering the believers together and teaching them. Now, when that happens, you run into certain difficulties. You run into opposition on certain truths. And if it's not real opposition, then it's very, very serious questions. And I'm going to try to go through about seven or eight of those in the little time that's left to me and uh, tell you what you actually run into. This is not theory. <laughs> this is first-hand experience. Um, one of the first things that uh, you discover is that these people say, I was baptized when I was an infant, or I was baptized when I was a child, or I was baptized when I joined the church. What do you do then? Ask them a question. Were you baptized as a believer? <sighs> you see, the order in Acts 2 is very clear. They that gladly received the word said they were baptized when they were infants. No, they didn't. 
they that gladly received the word were baptized. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. That's a very simple order. So you teach them the necessity of being baptized. It's not a door to the assembly. It comes before the door. And very clearly it is in the pattern of the New Testament. You're going to discover that they, they think the church is an organization. I mean, different denominations have different terms to use for this, but uh, it's a totally new thing to converts to teach them about the spiritual body, that they get into the body of Christ the very moment they trust the Savior. The Spirit of God puts them into the body, and they actually become a member of Christ the very moment they're saved. But then you have to teach them something else. You have to teach them that there is a great difference between the spiritual body and a local assembly. Now, there has been some very wrong teaching along this line. Uh, there are people who believe in three things. Uh, they believe that there's the company that meets together, then there's everybody that's saved in the area, and then there's all that profess. And they have three different things. No, no, that's not in the New Testament. You have to teach people that there is a distinction, clear and plain. In fact, I could give you, I could give you 14. If I had the time to do it, I could give you 14 distinctions between the spiritual body and a local assembly. And they're all in Scripture. I don't have to make them up. So you have to teach them the absolute difference between being saved and in the body and being received into an assembly of God. You have to show them, of course, that there is no human system or organization of men that will ever bring this about. Um, separation. It's more necessary than ever, dear brethren and sisters, that we teach separation from every human system, from every organization of men. And when you're doing that, of course, you're gonna come across something very precious. You see that, that text on the wall over there? Uh, they're beautiful texts, and I'm, I do mean the words, but I'm even referring to the way they are set. And you can thank Elizabeth Valance for that. Uh, you see that one over there? See that text over there? That's the John 3.16 of the assembly. See that verse? That's the John 3.16 of the gospel. I believe that verse just has every bit as much meaning for an assembly as that verse has for the gospel. Oh, you see, that's just one verse. It's one verse. It's one verse that follows all the way through our New Testament, especially in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Timothy. 1 Corinthians 5 and 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together. What other the name would they gather in? Now, I have often told this, but I think it might help some young Christian. I met a man one day, and uh, I happened to have a New Testament in my hand. So he said to me, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am. I'm born again. And he said, thank God. He said, I'm born again too. And I told him how I was saved. And I must confess, I was a little bit surprised. Then immediately he told me how he was saved. And it thrilled my heart to hear it. I have, I have an, I, you can't just go by a man's lips, but uh, uh, it, there was reality to it. And I thank God, here's a real believer. And then he said to me, what are you? I said, I'm a Christian. Oh, he said, I know that. But he said, um, what name do you take? And I said, what name would you believe the New Testament tells us to take? Oh, he said, I know, I know. But he said, uh, uh, what do you belong to? <laughs> I said, I belong to the Lord. <sighs> then he said, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm, I'm not speaking against the Presbyterian church, and I'm telling you this. I'm just giving you an explanation. And I said to the dear man, you know, when we were speaking about being saved, did, did you sense that we were one? Oh, yes, he said. Yes, he said, I felt that very much. I said, what are we now? Oh. A, a look of grief came over his face. You know what he said to me? He said, never before in my life did I see the evil 
of a second name as I do now. The evil of a second name. There's one name. There's no other name. Thank God we are gathered together in his name. Let us not ever add any second name to it. We believe in the priesthood of believers. This goes counter. Oh, oh, in the, in the great days of the Reformation, don't you remember that one of the truths that was recovered by Martin Luther and, his, and those who were with him was the great truth of the priesthood of all believers? So what has happened to it? The clergy system has taken over. So we have a clergy and laity, and people who you see saved, that's what they're used to. That's what they're accustomed to. And to tell them that there's no such thing as a one-man ministry, that all believers are a holy priesthood, that God has given gifts to different individuals, and those gifts function under the control of the Holy Spirit in an assembly. There's no one man who is the preacher, teacher, the man who prays, the man who worships. No such thing as that. T.D.W. Muir, in that uh, paper you maybe see downstairs, uh, tells about the man who came from the newspaper to witness the breaking of bread and said, who arranged the meeting? Well, thank God for the Holy Spirit arranging the meeting. I have been at many breaking of bread meetings in Chicago Boulevard and Stock Road. And I tell you, the meeting was arranged, very clearly arranged but arranged by the Holy Spirit. You have to explain that. It has to be taught. And of course, there's a great deal of rejection to that. They say, well, well, we've got to have a minister. We've got to have a pastor. Do they? There is no such thing in the New Testament as one man having all the gifts and all the priesthood being deposited in him. That's totally contrary to the New Testament. And let us see to it, brethren, by the way. Can I say this? Let us see to it that we never fall into any kind of a clergy system. Let us see to it that we don't contribute in any way to that clergy laity thing that is so common in the religious world. What do we recognize then? What do we recognize? If we don't recognize position, if we don't recognize that a man has a certain position that he fulfills and that's his job, if we don't recognize that, what do we recognize? Here's what we recognize. We recognize godliness. We recognize gift. And we recognize experience in the things of God. That's what we recognize. That's totally different than saying that we have one man and he's the minister, he's the preacher, he's the pastor, he's the teacher. In fact, there are places today that never had anything like this in the past and now they have a resident teacher. Please, let us never forget that we are called outside of all that system of men to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have no such thing as a clergy system. Sisters, this is a great difficulty you run into when you're trying to teach young believers. <laughs> the dear brethren don't have much difficulty with it, but of course the sisters do. <laughs> when we tell them that they are to be silent, woof. That doesn't go over with today's ideas, does it? It sure doesn't. You know, I can't make anything else out of the New Testament. A, 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 a pastor in a congregation told me one day that, of course, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34, that, that means that the women are not to be, to be speaking while the pastor is, is teaching them. And I said, now that's interesting because the word speak is found almost 20 times in this context. And in every other case, it means to publicly speak. So are you saying that in one verse, verse 34, it has a totally different meaning? He didn't want to say that. <laughs> he didn't want to admit that he ever said that. But you see, it's very clear. And then the sister recognizes one of the greatest truths that is eternal, that affects the universe. You know what it is? The truth of headship. Headship is one of the most vital truths of all scripture. I believe our sisters have a great ministry. <laughs> We've just been enjoying some of it. And 
Sisters have a ministry probably far greater than what most of us would understand. And much that is done is not done publicly and not done before the eyes of others, but it is done for the Lord's sake. Thank God for our dear sisters. I have known women who knew God far better than I do. And I respect that very deeply. In fact, I've been glad to sit at their feet and to learn from them. But the sister who understands the truth of headship is honoring the Lord Jesus in a remarkable way. Confessing that he is Lord, that he is the head of his own church, and that we bow to his authority and acknowledge his lordship in the assembly. That's what the sister does with her long hair and her covered head. There is a problem that comes up many times. Um, there are people who don't believe in anything physical. Uh, this is a, what's called O'Hare Doctrine in America. It was called Bullingerism in Europe. It says you don't have anything physical. Everything's spiritual, nothing physical. Do you know what they do with that? They dismiss the water of baptism. <laughs> it's physical, so we don't use it. Oh, how wrong they are. Water of baptism has tremendous meaning, spiritual meaning. They dismiss the idea of the actual bread and the wine to remember the Lord. That's physical, so we don't have that. Oh, what meaning they have. Dear Mrs. Louis Brandt told me that when she lost her eyesight, the thing that bothered her most was she couldn't see the bread and cup on the table anymore. How precious they are. They're physical. The Lord gave them to us. They are very precious. There's another physical thing that is actually has great spiritual meaning, and that is the sister's long hair and her covered head. You have to teach this. If you're going to see an assembly planted, you can't just hope that they'll all come together and they'll all agree. It has to be taught, sometimes painfully, sometimes amidst opposition. Uh, sometimes you have to answer questions that you never dreamed would be asked. What about funds? I remember a dear man who was in a denomination and we were preaching there and God was working and we were seeing an assembly formed. And uh, he asked me to go to one of his the services of his church one day. And I said, uh, I can't. He said, you make me sick. <laughs> that was plain enough. I didn't want to make the man sick. Uh, he said, uh, why won't you go? And I said, well, I don't know what's going to happen there, but you tell me. Will there be an offering? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, will everybody contribute to it? Yes, they should. Uh, will there be unsaved people there? Yes, of course. So I said, you know, you're taking part in something that's an abomination to the Lord. He said, what? He was so angry. He put his car in reverse. He was sitting at the wheel of his car, and I was standing outside of it. I'm glad I still have my toes, because he put his car in reverse and backed up in a terrible anger. He went to a meeting that next night with a group of men that he worked with, and he said to them, I can't any longer take part in this. They said, why not? So he turned to the book of Proverbs and read, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. He was angry at me, but he learned it. <laughs> Thank God we've learned it. May we never forget it. I've never heard a believer, I've never heard a man on our platforms ever ask for money for his work, ever. You thank God for that? We should. It's God's way. And we are glad to learn from him.